Hello everyone and welcome to today's AAA webinar, Forecasting and Strategy Post-COVID-19. For those who don't know me, my name is Sam Layton. I am the Regional Airports and Industry Development Manager here at the AAA. Today's webinar will cover topics such as aviation market update, forecasting objectives, approaches to forecasting, forecasting technique, techniques and strategies post-crisis. As always, the opportunity to ask questions will also be provided. I'm going to show you a screenshot of your attendee up on the screen now. You can see in the upper right hand corner, you have the option menu items for questions. You can click on the question button and submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar. And I will make sure um, I pass these along to Anthony uh, to answer at the end of his presentation. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter. Anthony. Um, unfortunately, David uh, was not able to join Anthony in today's presentation, um, but that's okay. Um, I'm sure Anthony is more than uh, capable of uh, presenting today. Uh, he has extensive cross-functional aviation experience gained from delivering projects across 17 countries in various operational planning and economic capacities. Starting his career in airport and airline operations in Toronto, Canada, Anthony has been based in Dubai, Kuala Lumpur, and now Australia to support aviation projects. Anthony assists clients to develop data-driven solutions to challenges facing the industry across a range of aviation disciplines. He is an advocate for the greater use of data-based and collaborative decision-making to drive the changes necessary to satisfy the growing needs of aviation stakeholders. He is particularly experienced in airline route analysis, market analysis, and forecasting. These presentations take a lot of time to prepare and I would just like to thank Anthony for preparing for today's webinar. Welcome Anthony um, and enjoy everybody. Thank you uh, Sam, I'm just getting loaded up here and so uh, Yes, if you got, everyone can hear me okay, that's great. Um, thank you again, Airport Association, for giving us the opportunity to present today. Uh, uh, as Sam mentioned, we're going to be covering forecasting and uh, uh, in that regard. Um, and we'll get right into it. Uh, we'll start off with a little bit about uh, Red Water. As an aviation transport. Uh, and focus on, on three business areas primarily. Uh, it's economics and strategy and data science and um, commercial and operations as well. Uh, working in both Australia and internationally, actually internationally it probably is um, where we're most active at the moment. Uh, this year we competed, competed in Laos and Malaysia as well. Uh, and I think uh, Sam did a great, uh, I won't go over my details again, but uh, and David, uh, as Sam mentioned, sends his apologies, he couldn't make it. Um, Quick background for him. Uh, he comes from an airport uh, planning um, uh, background. I've worked in a consultancy role. He was an airport planner, um, airport planning manager with Qantas. And unfortunately, he was let go because of COVID, but their losses are gained. So um, uh, we're happy to have him on board, and he does send his apologies. Seen on three areas today um, the uh, aviation market update, uh, forecasting approaches, objectives forecasting in the current environment. Uh, now, forecasting is a pretty wide range in subject. Everything in the, you know, what we do our best. Um, and I think the aim is to provide some level of insight in, uh, is developed and, and how it's changed because of COVID um, to give you guys some tools to move forecasting organization and maybe provide an alternate view. One thing that I've come to realize with forecasting is that it's not a one approach. Uh, there's many different ways to produce projections, um, and, and this is this is our take on it. Um, we'll get right into it. So, I think the title of that slide says it all. COVID-19 has decimated air travel. Um, so the graph here shows the monthly passengers from published from excuse me from VITRE. Uh, this is both domestic and international. We have a total line there as well. As you can see, the uh, market was handling on average about 13.5 million passengers a month. 
uh, and in April, 50,000. So just a complete um, waterfall uh, cliff, if you will, um, in April. May and June look much better. May, uh, April 20 is the, uh, the most currently available data from BITRE. Um, so 8% uh, for domestic and international declines, respectively. So um, it has really brought the industry to a stand. And you know, these are the numbers that, uh, that clearly demonstrate that. Um, if we see how much, uh, or try to get an idea of how many, how much passengers have been lost out of the system, if we, we've taken the total like teal um, there, and we overlaid the February data from 2019, uh, just as a guide, an approximate uh, volume of what should have been. Uh, February, March, and April 20. So uh, they, if you compare the, the data area, the gap, if you will, there's a, about 19 and a half million passengers um, that have been lost out of the market. In those, so you know, if you if May is the same as April, that's roughly 13 million. So add that to it, you're up to. So you know, potentially, and now looking at 50 million passengers being taken out of the market just by using the historical projections. So you know, within a margin of error, would be fairly indicative if uh, COVID hadn't happened. So it's it's been pretty uh, pretty. Um, now, so I think systemic risk has been used as a as a term used in the GFC, and I think this is uh, aviation's sort of GFC moment. Uh, and what infers that no one will be spared uh, from the from the issues. Uh, everyone has some. On one way, shape, or form. Now, the graph here shows the top 10 airports uh, in Australia, uh, also published from BITRE. Uh, and you can see that every single one had a marked decline. So, Sydney on a monthly basis was handling, you know, three and a half uh, to four million passengers a, a month. Uh, and in April, they handled 90,000. So, the same, the same, uh, the same level. Uh, the, uh, now, due to scaling issues, um, the 10 to, to the top uh, 10 to 20 airports, which is how BIG publishes um, some of the data uh, on airports, actually experienced zero passengers in April. Um, so it's pretty horrific. Um, widely, widely known, um, but just again, just give you the, the, what the numbers mean for each of the uh, each facility. Well, mining airports though fared a little bit better, but their traffic is underpinned by other by factors other than. Uh, market so you know they have mining charter uh, going in so uh, as long as that was a little permissible under uh, under uh, interstate or interstate um, restrictions then you know they have those airports still have traffic coming in and out uh, a little bit better and certainly some of the dialogues I've been having with uh, with those airports uh, indicate that's true uh, and certainly I think you've seen a surge uh, in the iron ore price and, and uh, blades so so, you know, they're probably the only success success story, or uh, maybe not even success story, but certainly the um, uh, uh, on-par story, if you will, uh, on, an unaffected story for, for COVID. Now, the, the current reality is that the market is changing on a daily basis. Uh, it really makes it difficult to what's going on, where the market's heading. Um, for example, I put this together, uh, these, these settings, you know, over the past week or so. Uh, and then just, just yesterday, WA is asking for a cap in international flights. It's looking to be about one every three days. Uh, Victoria is back on lockdown as of yesterday as well. Um, it's just everything's happening so quickly to find out what's going on. And this is probably the biggest challenge to, um, to forecasting because traditional say mathematical models aren't designed necessarily to handle this sort of um, this fluctuation you know and, it, and, and it's not all bad although uh, you know I lose, use that term loosely uh, headlines there that I grabbed uh, show some some change in the market some some opportunity coming up um, so Rex is looking to operate the Golden Triangle, and they're in the process of trying to secure five to ten uh, narrow-body aircraft. And Alliance is purchase aircraft as well, um, and they've actually started to 
um, operate to um, other destinations and then star routes. And that was the um, the Proserpine, Brisbane Proserpine, and then the um, Route to Arkans route as well. So it's there. Um, now those that I believe are underpinned from some government support programs, which is great. So it's good to see that the government is, is trying to do their best to support uh, aviation during these times uh, and, and, and get people flying there. Um, but again, this all makes forecasting uh, very difficult um, and plan every day something happens and something changes. So we'll get into forecasting approaches now. The headline of this slide is really the whole point, uh, I think, of, of a lot of this discussion is that it's important to understand the objectives of a forecast prior to undertaking the exercise. A short-term forecast will look a lot different from a long-term forecast. You know, generally, I think you can see that there's three sort of timelines uh, with forecasting short-term, medium-term, and long-term. And each is to be made tactical to semi-strategic and then strategic decisions for the more long-term. Uh, what, what do I mean by Staffing and resource levels, you know, shift patterns, stuff like that. Uh, do you need to bring in extra resources for a, or a, a you know, a, a long weekend is happening? Is there going to be surging demand? Short-term budgeting, you know, stand management, uh, check-in management, uh, check and counter management, stuff like that. And they're more focused on your weekly demand. Whereas alternatively, you have your long-term forecast, which you know would go to inform capex capacity planning uh, and even airport investment you know in terms of uh, whether or not uh, the airport is a, an attractive investment for, for, for a company looking to get involved in airport management um, and they're mostly focused on annual level demand and then peak periods as well uh, and that could be peak hour now different from the uh, I know we got hour in the short term over there but uh, this is more just the, the, the annual peak hour so you can you know plan uh, um, facilities accordingly and different timelines will have a different um, we'll use different parameters um, underpin their their assumptions so uh, here's a, a sort of indicative rule of thumb if you will period that you know in the short term we're looking at supply side indicators so capacity announcements uh, and you're doing from that uh, point of view and then as you get further on you, you know that becomes more difficult to forecast so uh, demand indicators so gdp is a great one especially on a national level or, or an airport that represents maybe a, a, a uh you know you're looking at gdp uh and then changes perhaps in, in price and, and what have you and that as people become more uh, more wealthy they have more disposable income uh, and higher gdps are linked with a higher um, some airports are lucky enough um, that they can access demand levels, though, on short-term timeframes uh, and can produce operational level forecasts using actual demand levels, which is really powerful. So, involved in, in the Middle East, and they have a uh, tactical uh, forecasting section, and they get um, for booking data. And they can um, they can produce these operational um, operational level uh, forecasts to inform um, to inform the stakeholders um, and, and the terminal operations teams as well. So you know you can it's not uh, it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, that's how it follows. Um, you know supply, short term demand, more long term. And forecast forecasting approach is generally fall into three categories. You have qualitative uh, time series and calls and models and categories on that screen. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so qualitative models, uh, you know these are the judgmental models. Um, and, and generally uh, can be used to test other models as well. So, you know, if, if a model, you know, you can test test that result against, uh, you know, a judgment. Uh, is, is it 10% growth rate next year? Probably not for whatever reason. The, the, the mathematical model or, or whatever you're using is putting, um, pushing that out. You can use that to test. Um, and, and the last point there in the red box can form part of other approaches, the bottom-up approach, um, which is a uh, qualitative model there. You can have time series projections as well, which is a very simple projection of historical growth rates. So if you had an airport that grew 5% per year uh, on average uh, for 20 years, 
for that 5% growth rate into the future. It's very, very simple, very quick to calculate though. So it's a good, uh, at times it can be a good, a good way to just do a quick uh, spot check. Um, but it's not very useful to deal with large swings in traffic. So if your projection, you know, you might get away with this, but if you're going to do a next year projection, you know, just adding 5% on, not going to be helpful. Uh, especially in this current environment, for example, you know, you would not would not have been able to 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 um, historical analysis to kind of forecast this this massive drop. Um, so it's more kind of a long term, um, or it can be a more uh, model. Then you have causal models, which you know use the statistical relationship between traffic and, and what. These are your regression analysis and linear and multivariate and what have you. Uh, it can be time consuming as. You uh, variables to kind of plug in and test and make sure that it's robust uh, and these are more useful during the medium to as well I generally don't see these in the short term but you know um, you can if you have a, a good uh, indication of the, of the market uh, now this last one here this building block and bottom-up approach uh, is probably the uh, almost the most accurate um, way of looking at the the short term whether it be six months to a year to two years maybe uh, possibly even up to three it's based on on forecasting from incremental capacity gains of, of or capacity additions uh, to an airport's network so for example if, if uh, an airline has announced that they will be uh, from january 1st a seven a week um a320 you know you can you can just add Look at how many seats that produces, and then put a load factor on that to get your traffic. And then, and you know, you know, they have announced that they are going to be flying it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a building block approach, and it's quite uh, quite useful. Um, sort of more dynamic approaches to things. Um, they tend to be a bit uh, years though, because of course you're, you're trying to just guess at that point. You don't know what the airlines are going to be doing. But if you have some credible some credible uh, data, you know, whether you're talking to an airline and they say, yes, we are going to be uh, announcing that route, or you, then, you know, it's it's, it's direct uh, direct feed from the market. So it's a, it can be accurate from that point of view. Like I said, useful. So a forecast strength, I think, rests in its use across multiple business units. And uh, I think there's, I think we can all probably agree that the activity at airports is primary, primary of passenger uh, and aircraft um, traffic over a given period of time. Uh, about how many coffees you're going to sell, well, that's actually linked directly to um, how many passengers. Uh, you know, you know that there's a certain spend per passenger, so that you know that 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 forecast of passengers that you see you can actually get down to how many coffees um, you 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 might likely uh, sell on a, on a given year. Or whatever time frame you want um, and you can or you can then also look at technical decisions that you need the aircraft stands are needed at some point in the future and what size does the terminal need to be so you know and these are just two examples by no means it's exhaustive it's just a, an example um, of, uh, of uh, what you can do as an exercise so all these different modules that can hang off of it and that's where I think you get a lot of power um, when you a forecast across the entire organization. Now, I've done a very uh, simple, very simple example. I want to make that very clear. This is by no means it's uh, you know um, uh, you tested and what have you. Just just made up numbers, um, but it proves the point. So we have a ten-year forecast for an airport that was handed passengers a year, and you know as you can see, uh, the year-on-year -year growth rate that we assumed is five percent. And uh, we have a peak hour passenger as well. Um, this is a derivation of that uh, annual traffic level. And it just grows. It just grows as a forecast. Uh, nothing to get too excited about. But in the modules following that, you can see we, just from a commercial point of view. So in this case, uh, there's two, two revenue, uh, uh, revenue avenues for this airport. We have a retail spend, which is at $5 and just grows with inflation. Uh, and then an arrow. Goes with inflation, and it's just a, a, a multiplication of, of that 
that dollar value times the revenue forecast, and, and, and that just gets projected out. At the same time, using the exact same uh, numbers, which is that you know, we can look at it from a technical point of view using peak hour passengers. So here we've assumed uh, a certain square meter, 18 square meters. And we just times that by the peak hour passenger, and we need a you know a nine thousand square meter terminal for this. And then car car spaces are the same. Um, you know, if you assume one point five car spaces per peak hour passenger, you get the the loading of of, of um, uh, how many car spaces you need as well. So, you know, the, you can debate the numbers to the cows come home really, but the point is that you know once you do a forecast, um, you can you can really build. Um, and uh, you know I've, I've seen some big um, some big financial models being driven off of work, um, clients in Southeast Asia where uh, it was a PPP um, project you know basically they took our raw, raw numbers and dumped into their model and they were forecasting uh, you know all the all the revenue and capex that goes with that so uh, just a, a simple forecasting exercise uh, and you can see that if you're uh, continual basis you can actually build a fairly you know linked and sizable model that uh, has different modules on it um just off right if you will so very powerful um when you when you start linking it across the business but uh you know uh, we can't turn lead into gold and the same is true with forecasts as a whole joke and i think it's really important <clears throat> to, to do a deep dive market I think that's one of the critical factors um, so that you understand the market conditions that you're playing in you know how the different segments stack up um, and, and, and we know um, I guess what those we can play with in our forecast and a few examples as to how you get you know an understanding of the market we have your survey dots so whether that be catchment or or uh, you know on-site surveying um, capacity announcements market segments is a big one or are you um, and just on the business side you know for example if uh, you know the 30 percent of your airport is and you you know I think there's general consensus that business traffic might be subdued for some time you know you can probably build a model that if our traffic um, coming back quicker than, than business it all depends on what level of granularity you want to get into Tourism and business developments within a catchment. So if, if your catchment is building a, a, a massive uh, sports stadium that's good for international uh, matches, uh, that will drive likely drive traffic at your airport. So you know when does that come online? Oh, two years time. So we'll put that into our forecast model as well. Uh, and then growth of benchmark airports is also pretty good. So what are your peers doing? Faring better than are they experiencing the surge in, in demand for whatever reason? Um, you know is that 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 I mean, it's attractive to airlines, so maybe it's a uh, leisure focused uh, regional centers. <clears throat> so, is that a topic over the next few years? Um, are you seeing that in your peer airports? Can, can you get on top of that as well? Uh, and then, so uh, that's also pretty important as well. Um, and I think, you know, the last point there, understanding the market results. It's, you know, it's one thing to say 5% year on year growth, which is great. Um, but what actually happens? happen for that to be achieved is okay well let, let's take a more extreme example say we're going to forecast 20 percent growth and it's going to be like 100,000 passengers well um or 10 percent we'll use our sample 10 percent growth on 100,000 million passengers so 100,000 passengers what needs to actually happen well that's actually an equivalent to a seven per week a320 or a 737 so that has to materialize um somehow whether that be through additional frequencies by uh, on um, you know, a new route to coming online. Uh, so, you know, you can kind of validate that. So when you start seeing these, you go, well, well you know, passengers is a lot. So what's driving that? You know, can we validate our forecast results by our market knowledge? So getting to the forecasting during COVID. It, now I hope you, uh, everyone appreciates the radar screen on there, on the, on the image there. Everyone talks about a crystal ball, but this is aviation. so screen i think it's a bit more pudding um and you know i think for a lot of the 
you know, dot points on a radar screen. They were traditional. We understood them. They were moving very well. But there's, you know, a big blank screen, and it's almost like a you know, stealth, stealth fighter on the screen or something like that, where you just didn't, you didn't see it until it was too late, um, and you couldn't have ever predicted it. I mean. I, um, anyone, I think, would, if they produced a COVID forecast, uh, you know, a year ago, you would just shake your head. I mean, that you know, traffic would go down to zero. Um, you know, it's just, it's just absurd. So, um, uh, forecast approaches um, had to be kind of modified from from this. Um, I think it isn't being isn't responding to traditional economic indicators. They're being suppressed by external factors health measures, movement restrictions, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> to me, I think if job losses were to continue, then you have economic uh, hamper the recovery if you go into a recession or something like that, or, or a depression. But I think for the time, it's mostly the, the um, artificially imposed restrictions that are, that are some of the biggest issues. Um, and I think, you know, point there the changes in the market are occurring daily. So, uh, you know, you really need to adapt how, how you look you know, forecasting models and, and, and what's what's going into them uh, in order to um, uh, to provide some indication of a result. Now, uh, I think <clears throat> this this blue formula here. This is from the Airport Council International. It's generally used for um, level uh, forecasting. They don't worry about the logs and, and what have you, but that's generally how they look at the world. And basically, it's saying that from GDP, which is income, um, and price. So, uh, you know, as you as you earn more, great, um, or fluctuates, I should say, then then um, then uh, that induces traffic. And there's the, that, uh, and that's everything else. So you have two main variables, and then you have everything else. And uh, that error, and that has become increasingly large. So um, I think GDP and, and, and prices are, are generally not affecting what's going on as much as, as this error term. Um, and also, too, you know, the statistical data, you know, we're getting massive swings in the market, um, but you might not even have GDP data available to even, even you know, forecast that because it's just happening so quickly. So, you know, these, these, these kind of econometric models tend to fall down, at least in the short term. Now, there's a number of ways uh, recoveries take shape generally. Um, Four that you know I see generally discussed, it could be more, um, but these are the four sort of topics that we see. You have a V-shaped recovery, uh, which is also used a sharp decline and then a then a, a quick increase. Um, so that was off from the traffic in um, uh, say 11 for example, and we'll show that on on the following slide. Just a sharp decline and an increase. You have this check mark recovery, which is a sharp decline and then a slower recovery. Still fairly, uh, still fairly quick, really relatively quick. Yeah, this this U shape, which is a sharp ended, um, period of uh, depressed uh, depressed activity, and then a uh, then a recovery from, from that point forward. W, which is repeated declines and recoveries, and uh, Victoria came to mind actually when I was thinking about that one because you had a sharp decline. Uh, into, you know, domestic uh, activity was starting to pick up, um, albeit slowly, but then now they've locked down again, so. Uh, so whatever recovery they had um, was going to fall, um, and then eventually you get to to a stable. I think that you know the general consensus in the market. I think we, the way we've seen some of the um, some of the the check mark shape look, uh, recovery pattern is probably the most likely. So uh, just previously about 9/11 and the V-shaped recovery, um, you can see that here on the screen. Um, so. Interestingly, interestingly enough, the Australian market has only ever seen uh, two uh, years or two periods of year on year uh, for the past 34 years, which is pretty impressive. So there's a probably dispute where we saw a recovery were uh, two, two and a half years. Uh, so, you know, more of a check mark recovery from that point of view. And then 9 11 was the decline and um, exceeded in the, uh, the following year, uh, the, the pre crisis level. So, very sharp. Um, 
so you know I think there's some precedent in the market, and you know this is one way you can look at it. Uh, applicable to a specific airport but you know there's, there's some there's some confidence that you know the, as the market recovers that you know maybe check mark is probably the most likely so uh a uh, scenario um uh sorry we haven't talked about scenario yet the uh, the way down some of the conventional um the conventional uh method of doing things is to a scenario framework um, and that is a essentially in this case a big what if question well what if traffic recovers what if it uh, doesn't recover uh, as quickly as we'd like so uh, that's one way to get around some of these big swings in traffic that you can you can start to um, to, to build in these 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 essentially um, made up i hate to use that word but essentially what they are i mean you're making them up, uh, causes or, or probable outcomes and some insights that you know of the market but you you know you see what you can recover based on certain assumptions um and I, I, we developed four scenarios there um they uh sorry one's a v-shaped recovery uh, so this is a 12 month moving um average by the way uh this is uh, all this is just a, every every month shown as a year-ending period. Uh, scenario one, we just just again we take this for bottom, or we don't endorse this, but it gives you an idea of what um, they could come come about to. You know, if we need declines and then a recovery by about mid-year, August, September, I think it was, and then I think that one represents a turn. Uh, you can see that V-shaped recovery. Scenario two is more of a check mark, so same decline, but it tends to take about two years to recover. Scenario three is this U-shaped recovery, um, where we uh, have a kind of a continued period of depression uh, or suppression of traffic, and then it eventually recovers. So a vaccine is found after some time. So then we can, can come back, for example. Um, and scenario four um, recovery, but it's a very extended one as well. Um, and the crisis uh, triggered, in this case, a, a deep economic recession. It lasted for about four years, um, just eventually uh, in April 2024 to sit in slightly before, below pre crisis. Um, so you can kind of see how by building scenario models, you um, uh, you can see how things are just going to progress based on what you know of the market. In this case, as our main variable, and we see how that returns. Um, but it gives you uh, the range to 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 kind of you know really play with a few things now uh, important note conventional forecasts also use scenarios they do scenarios generally um but those those high and low scenarios are, are generally driven by changes in independent variable you go, okay well, what if gdp doesn't grow at five percent maybe it's only three percent um or maybe it's seven percent so you get these high as well whereas this is much more building block approach um, based on travel restrictions so you can see how you can do these what ifs a lot better and I think you know talking to some of the airlines uh, and some of the airports uh, both regional and and uh, and international ones major capital airports they're doing the same thing it's it's building block approaches based on on news announcements frames have become very very tactical and I think you'll see here um, you know uh, sort of forecasting model uh the black box uh, approach you know you, you dump all these 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 Australia's boosting domestic flights great Qantas link is going to be competing on Rex I think they announced Sydney to Orange and then the bubble can restart in September so you can dump all these announcements into the what if scenarios you know and then and then up pops a, a pop um but you know I think fundamentally we go back to it uh to the, an earlier point is that you need to have the forecasting uh, exercise in order to um to to understand the outcomes what actions or decisions do we need to take now based on this information and do we need to let to do we need to delay um do we can we keep the current size of the workforce or what can we prepare for now uh what time frame do we, what do we need here in the example on that on the on the right hand side of the very simple graph. It's you know based on this scenario. 
if traffic returns in two months, we don't need to lay off any workers. So, um, but you know, as you get closer to that line, maybe you do, but you need to build your what if scenarios and, and go from there. Um, so, just summing up a few key points. Uh, a forecast primary use is to support decision making. So, forecasting for forecasting is, like, is a lovely academic exercise, but really, you need to someone's making decisions based on those outcomes so that's really important to keep in mind it needs to be uh, it needs to be uh, focused on what decisions need to be made from that um uh, difficult to understand your uh, outputs because that's going to design um, uh, guide your overall inputs it could be incredibly incredibly complex so really it's a matter of understanding what level of detail you need and therefore you know you might get away with uh, we think in three months' time we'll be at fifty percent of where we were, and then we'll just grow that at five percent. That that's enough for for the decisions that we need. That's enough. And um, or if you're a, a more complex organization, uh, or economic factors, stuff like that, uh, or more decisions need to be made, then you can see how these models get incredibly complex as well. COVID nineteen is that a required rethink on on conventional models? Um, the dynamicism of uh, means that you know building blocks what if scenario approach is a much better way to sift through the noise if you will but you know on that I think airline and industry engagement are absolutely key to this model success uh, changing the schedules for example you know we ran a schedule query in May ran the same query in June um, and for uh, you had something like two and a half million uh, seats changed in, in that month so so have been updated um, in that monthly period to, to just you know um, take a, a two, two, two million. So you know even traditional data sets like that are, are, are struggling to keep up. Things are just happening so quickly. So residents and passengers can really help understand um, what they think about the current situation. Are, are they looking to travel right away? Do, um, an appetite for travel under the new normal? Are they? Do they believe in health measures? Do they uh, not? So they not believe are they too inconvenienced by the health measures they don't want to fly with face masks and face shields and what have you so they just thought not to go uh what do they think about travel restrictions do they think travel restrictions are going to be too uh invoked too confidence to plan that's a big one as well um and you know i think information sharing can support a recovery as quick as possible you know, if you're surveying residents or have some knowledge or engaging with the airlines, you know, sharing that information across uh, multiple constituents, both, you know, maybe in your airport or tourism operators or what have you, you know, that can help get them ready to drive recovery. So you can see how a forecast um, can be a medium to, to drive a, a growth and a drive recovery because it kind of focuses people on getting these numbers together. And then once it's spitting out, we can drive from there. So that's have right now. Um, so I think we'll just open it up to um, some questions. Um, I'm just going to put my so you can see me. And Thanks, Anthony. Um, we uh, we do actually have um, a couple of questions that have come through. So we'll start off. Um, what approach can we take in forecasting the RPT? Non RPP, traffic and growth in the near future, considering aging and also new airport infrastructure. The traffic forecast affects capex spend and consideration in rehabilitation um, of aging infrastructure and design input for new infrastructure. That was from Sam. Sam, Sam sir. You've just broken up um, a bit through that, but uh, it was, uh, can you just repeat the question? Hopefully, I can make 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 a uh, piece of it. Oh, sorry. Um, what approach can we take in forecasting the RPT and non-RPT, such as freight traffic growth in the near future, considering aging and also new infrastructure? Um, the traffic forecast affects capex spend and considerations in rehabilitation of aging infrastructure. Yeah, well, I uh, was 
So uh, it's still slightly a bit broken, but I think you're asking about uh, what approach you can take for RPT traffic and, and non-RPT traffic, such as freight. Um, well, I think uh, I think what we talked about is probably um, you know pretty valid in terms of uh, from an RPT point of view, um, forecasting in the short term, looking at what the airlines and airlines directly uh, what they what they have plans uh, for. I think um, you know as you get outside more uh, back towards more uh, traditional forecasting approaches. So if you're looking at for example, as an indicator, or so whatever indicator that you might find at your airport, then I think that's still valid as well. For example, it um, has a high linkage to um, national mining employment. So if that uh, finds an indicator like that for your airport that's non vital, um, then you can forecast. Uh, I think, you know, definitely looking at a building block approach in the first uh, kind of zero to three years that you forecast is probably the um, uh, same with freight, you know, conducting a freight study and then finding out how much demand is out there and what it's currently doing. And then, um, you know, is it by going by road? Is it going up road up to, and then getting the form from there? Can you capture that back? Um, kind of like leakage with passengers, but from a freight point of view. Could you look at, um, you know, a stimulation effect? So if you do get uh, freight, uh, what could you do in terms of uh, stimulating, or that, what could that do to stimulate traffic demand uh, from both a, a shifting point of view, so shift the supply chain in your favor, and also then growing, growing the underlying freight demand. So there's two, two causes there. Um, so I think uh, from a forecast point of view, yeah, again, look at the short term, do the building block approach, and then you can go from the more econometric or, or top-down levels from that, that point forward. Um, I think it's probably best. Is, is that, uh, does that sound like a decent answer? Uh, I think it does. Um, I think that covered it. Um, but uh, Shannon, if you're still um, on the line, feel free to, um, if that covered your question or, or it didn't, um, please let us know and, and we can ask Anthony some further um, questions. Um, we've got Julie as well. Uh, can you suggest any resources or websites to assist in forecasting, particularly in the regional airport space? Uh, any any websites? Um, uh, yeah, interesting. Well, it depends on kind of how big you want to um, what you want to chew off. I mean, the ABS, uh, the, the you know one of the go tos, I guess. Um, but there's other resources would be uh, it's not a website necessarily, but OAG data um, can get expensive, mind you, though, but it's very very powerful as well. Um, the, the IATA systems as well. Um, you know, I, I think, yeah, online resources, there's a multitude of, 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 of what you could probably find up there. I'm trying to think there's a, um, economy ID, uh, dot ID as well, uh, pro that I use sometimes. Um, it's good for regional levels, it profiles the uh, underlying uh, regional um, economics. It's quite good and, uh, for your deep dive analysis. Um, that's it for online resources. There are free online resources anyway, um, but I think you know uh, airline engagement would be probably the go to talk to talk to them, especially in this environment where you're trying to find out what's going to happen in the next one to two to three six months. Yeah. Thank you for that, Anthony. Um, I have a couple more. Um, is Microsoft Excel or other spreadsheet programs the usual tool for forecasting or data analytics, or are there alternatives in the market? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, look, Excel is probably the go-to uh, for modeling. It's just that everyone has kind of used it. It's, it's easy, um, well, easy enough, I guess, uh, formulas. Um, so that's, that's it's generally accepted. Everyone has some kind of level of experience with them as Excel, but uh, yeah, there's some great alternatives on the market right now that are, are, are starting to become a bit more uh, integrated. Uh, one that I'll, uh, um, that's a dashboarding uh, business intelligence tool, but you can also uh, do modeling in 
Um, and that's really good from an enterprise point of view. So you can really integrate, um, you know, uh, the model uh, across digitally. So you're not having to, um, you know, print out and make reports and stuff like that. You're everything on the dashboard. Um, but yeah, ability in that as well. It, you can also then forecast or produce your forecast uh, in a pretty user friendly way. Uh, Six although really is, is is still I think one of the the, the easiest ones. Is there any sort of spreadsheet program where you can deal with large volumes of data? So it's still pretty powerful. Um, it is often said that a forecast is out of date the moment it's produced. Um, so why do one in the first place? Yeah, so uh, that is true. The moment you produce, especially uh, in this current environment where uh, you know you can you can use an assumption and then tomorrow the assumption changes. Um, so why do one in the first place? Well, I, th I think you know there's a lot of planning that goes around, in, especially in aviation. Uh, you know, the question before uh, was about um, you know infrastructure um, planning and, and capex and capex programs. You know, that's. Uh, that it's expensive to build stuff. So, you know, you need to have some indication as to what's going on. And, uh, and even, even from a short-term point of view, maybe doing revenue planning or, or trying to attract a new commercial retail tenant, uh, you know, has to kind of provide for the business case. Um, yeah, they are out of date. Uh, the, um, I'd rather have a forecast in hand that, you know, is some semi-reliable or hopefully uh, indication of what the future could look like, such that you know you can make decisions. Um, uh, as, I think a great example is is the weather. You know the weather forecast. Um, you know you might get a, a weekly forecast and say the Friday is going to be rainy, um, and you think, oh, I'm going to plan a picnic on that day. Uh, you know I know my but we'll, we'll, we'll pencil it in, and, and that kind. Of, and then as the day gets closer, you can adjust from there, right? So um, that's why I think make decisions for the future um, today and the, and the forecast is still the best way to do it. Thanks, Anthony. And we've got one last question. Um, is forecasting and air service development linked? Can one inform the other? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So route development, Especially on, on the on the on the uh, on the short term time frames uh, and forecasts, and I, I are absolutely well, you can you can use the route development um, activity. So if you're talking to an airline and they've announced capacity, you can dump that into your forecast model um, and then run it off that. Alternatively, alternatively, if you look at it the other way around, if you have a route development strategy and you want to get um, you know, uh, these new routes over the next one, two, and three to five years. You know, you're going to get three three frequencies a week this year. Next year, probably go up to five. Next year, to seven. You know, so you're building up what, uh, and that's what you're pursuing with the airlines as well. That's where your target is. Um, you know, capacity traffic because you know if you've got a hundred, hundred, you know, hundred thousand seats that are coming into the market next year, you know, you throw. And 80 percent, whatever. Uh, you got 80,000 additional passengers. So, you know, I think they, they're 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 they're. Um, you know, I'm I'm sometimes shocked actually um, that there's a disassociation between the two. Um, and, you know, to the forecasting people, because in the short term, they're they're absolutely, um, they're absolutely almost the same thing as far as I. Thank you, Anthony. Um, that concludes um, the questions that we've received uh, for today at the end of your webinar. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to say uh, thank you. Um, as I suggested um, in my intro, these webinars take a lot of preparation um, and the AAA really appreciates you uh, putting that time in and coming along to present to our members today, so thank you. Um, today's webinar recording will be available in Airport Alert and email to everyone directly once available. Um, I'm encouraging you to provide feedback on any other topics that you would like to see covered in the 2020 webinar series. Um, you can email events at airports.asn.au. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Our next webinar will be held on Wednesday, the 22nd of July, uh, presented by Oricon Group, with the topic being the airport of the future, planning for post-pandemic facilitation. 
Please everyone enjoy the remainder of your afternoon, week, uh, stay safe, especially uh, those people that have joined us uh, from Victoria today. And we look forward to seeing you all online at the next webinar. Thank you.